lost to ignorance and confusion. Three men arose from humble beginnings with a message of wisdom and hope for their troubled times. Three men who would eventually change the very face of humanity. But they were not the droids we're looking for. So, here are some other guys. It's Song Talk Radio with Michael, Neil, Phil, and the gang. Hey there, welcome back to the show, folks. So glad you could join us here as we talk about songwriting and songwriting accessories. This is a show for fellow songwriters, no matter what level you are at. Each week we meet uh, here to talk about the craft of songwriting. We share tips, we share t- tricks, and stuff we've figured out along the way. And sometimes we talk about other things because we get distracted very easily. <laughs> and along for the ride uh, today, Mr. Neil Modi. How you doing, Neil? Songwriting accessory A, reporting for duty. <laughs> and Mr. Michael Proudfoot. How you doing, Michael? I'm well, thank you, and I will be an accessory after the crime. (laughs) Accessory to the crime. (laughs) We'd love to hear your thoughts on songwriting or anything else uh, on the show, uh, for that matter. So send us a message at feedback at songtalk.ca or leave a message on the YouTube page. And if you're on the YouTube page, why don't you click on that subscribe button because then you'll be uh, happy. Subscribed. Yes, that's true. So we got some uh, some follow up and some things to talk about. Neil, it is yes, something really neat this week. Why don't you tell us about this tuning system you looked into? Yeah, so this was uh, we mentioned this on the show a few weeks ago, where uh, Mike had forwarded us um, a link to a, an article in the Wire magazine about this um, interesting global tuning system by which you can use your MIDI instruments, which are normally confined to your typical twelve-note equal temperament Western scale. And uh, this uh, this UK instrumentalist composer uh, Kaya Malami um, developed this software, web-based software, whereas you can uh, cook up your MIDI instrument to it and select one of the, the programmed uh, scales, um, African, Indian, Middle Eastern, Chinese, um, Persian, all sorts of different scales in library. Or you can actually invent your own scale and define your own intervals within an octave and then use your MIDI uh, keyboard to play um, along with that scale. So over the weekend, I, I delved a little bit deeper into it and um, and uh, actually wrote a small, like, 30-second orchestral piece um, based on an African uh, balafon scale, which I never heard of before. Um, and, uh, yeah, I posted that up, up to my YouTube channel. And it, it's a really interesting thing, and I'm still sort of wrapping my head around, like, is this a potential venue to go down? And, like, how, how deep does this rabbit hole go? <laughs> you know, because it, be, it could be a bit of a thing um, to really delve into. Uh, but uh, it, it really, it really, it, it, it put, it's, it's, it's sort of like you always say, Phil, about tuning your guitar in a different way. Like for us keyboardists, we don't really have those venues to do that sort of thing. So this has really kind of put my head into a different space because, you know, developing a melody with that scale was not the same feeling, the same kind of approach that it would take to developing a melody with a typical Western scale. So it was, it was interesting. Oh, very cool. Mm-hmm. Now, um, does it have actually, because uh, there's even temperament and then there's just temperament, which I think was happened, which existed just before even temperament. Yeah, just temperament. I'm, I'm assuming he has it in there because he does have a category for like Western experimental or okay. Western old or something like that. I ignored the Western ones. I went to the other ones. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, but um, I, I, I would assume that in, uh, in, in even tempered scale. Um, is probably in his in his wheelhouse there. Oh, cool! Did you have any trouble uh, getting your stuff to work with these weird temperaments? Or the only the only difficulty I had was that because the system he uses um, he uses uh, very specific programmed pitch bend commands to to oh. articulate the different pitches. Because when you hit a D on your keyboard, it's you know you've you've tuned it so it's actually somewhere between a D and an E. Well, you need a pitch bend control. Uh, command to actually m- move that pitch. So if the software instrument you're using, or the hardware instrument for that matter, if the patch you're using doesn't respond to pitch bend, then it ain't going to work. So I tried wiring it through a native instrument's piano, and I'm like, pitch bend doesn't 
the pitch bend's not a thing on a piano <laughs> patch, so it doesn't it doesn't work. So I had to find, you know, explore a bunch of different patches and screw around with the pitch bend wheel on my keyboard to discover which patches work with pitch bend and which don't. I mean, most synth synthesizer type patches, of course, will work mm. with with um, with the pitch bend. I think mostly the traditional sample based instruments like pianos and strings and brass, even brass should really because you can do a trombone slide and whatever, but um, you know, traditionally sample-based instruments, I would think, may or may not have pitch bend, whereas synthy type instruments probably will. Really cool. Yeah, but that was really the only limitation. Other than that, it's like super easy, very user-friendly interface that he developed, and you can pick your input and output just like anything else. And you do need a virtual MIDI cable, um, which I explained in my video how to where to download it from, and and so you can patch it through your uh, DAW. But it's pretty straightforward. That's very interesting. So we'll link to your video on the site. So yeah. if our listeners have been intrigued by it, they can find out more. Ooh. And actually, it'd be interesting to hear uh, if our listeners do some experimenting with it, yeah. uh, what they come up with as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it, it's fun. Uh, Indian music uh, has its own um, scale as well, doesn't it? Yeah, it, it, it depends. I mean, it, it depends how far back you go. I think old, old rag music does kind of play with a few a few of the notes but it, it's it is mostly built on built up on perfect fifths um the way that western music is is pretty oh. close um but you know there you know with with every with every culture there's a slight difference here and there yeah but um you know the tra just traditionally indian music like the the drone in indian music like you're, you're playing it on a, a sitar or something like that is typically a a root and a fifth right as as we know it and then you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of sliding in between notes with vocalists and with string players and things like that. So there's there's those articulations, yeah, flavor as well. There's, there's a lot of things that go into tone and pitch and then <laughs> give it character, right? So yeah. it's yeah, that's really cool. I've always wanted to actually get uh, some someone who writes that kind of music actually on the show because I mm. I find that fascinating I, and actually it's a form of music I really like. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, so please um, I check. Check out the uh, show notes, and we'll have the link to um, <coughs> Neil's um, Neil's video. Yeah, I watched it. It's really, really uh, fascinating stuff. Thank you, man. Yeah, yeah. That. cool, cool. Thanks for and, doing it, Neil. <coughs> yes. So we got an email from uh, Michael H. Um, Hi, Phil. I listened to your podcast with Michelin. You guys did a great job. I've listened to many of the interviews of hers over the years and really enjoyed the approach you take. Quest question. I am not a drummer, but I am curious about the drum set you picked up. How are they? I am thinking of getting a set for fun, as I think it's always good to try to learn new skills. Curious about your thoughts. Uh, the price certainly is good. All the best, Michael. Well, um, great, Michael. Not, uh, thanks. Um, well, I actually uh, came today. Uh, it took a little while to um, get here. Um, first thing, it comes in a really big box, which is really heavy. You almost mm. need two people to carry it because mm. um, it's got like the uh, all the, all the mechanical stuff. Uh, one point I wanted to mention is when you go into the Donner Deal website, mo uh, most of the kits come with everything, like the uh, the drums, a drum throne, even a pair of headphones. Kick pedal, and a kick pedal. Wow, um, and never like an actual kick like an actual kick pedal. Yeah, you know, not just a switch, but an actual mechanical kick pedal. Mm. Um, but so the one I got actually had um, three cymbals, so like two crashes and a ride is the idea. Um, but it was actually not the most expensive one, even though it seemed to have more pieces than the others, which I thought was weird. Mm. Um, Quantity does not equal quality. Uh, yeah, but I thought that was kind of strange, so I did get it. So if you are going to get um, the set that I got, the one with the uh, the hi-hat and the three cymbals, it does not come with a drum throne, ah. and or oh, nor does it come with a pair of headphones. Now, the headphones isn't that big a deal. I mean, I have lots of headphones. Um, I have something that would work as a drum throne. But, um, you know, if someone was looking forward to it and they didn't have, you know, a suitable seat, it could be a little bit disappointing. So um, that's something you might want to um, 
think about it. it took a bit of fidget you know it took a little while to put it together i just basically finished putting it together about half an hour ago mm. and um you know it's it's certainly no replacement for a roland you know twelve hundred dollar um kit um but um it's kind of fun. I, it has a couple of things that you're supposed to be able to choke the uh, symbols. Like you hit the symbol and grab it and it's supposed to stop it. Mine doesn't seem to do that. And I don't know mm. if that's a setting or mm. if there's something um, uh, broken. You know, sometimes the problem with some of these very cheap products is, you know, the quality assurance can be a bit rough. Um, but, um, and there's a couple of uh, sensitivity settings. Um but it, you actually get like a real mechanical drum of uh, uh, foot pedal that actually hits like an actual uh, pad. Mm -hmm. So that was so it's it's actually pretty impressive for for what you get, you know. What's the feel of the heads? You said they were mesh. Yeah, they are mesh, and they certainly feel um, quite uh, quite good, much better than just the um, standard, you know, foam rubber stuff that you know the old uh, kits used to have. Um, the symbols are they're okay. I mean, again, again, I played with this for you know like twenty minutes, if that. So I'm still trying to figure out how it works. Um, it has fifteen kits, and the kits are okay. Um, it'll be inter interesting to see um, if I, as I hook it up to uh, the MIDI about uh, using it to play drums, you know, on my DAW mm -hmm. um, and how that'll work. Um, it comes with uh, a pair of drum or a pair of uh, drumsticks. Uh, not the best drumsticks, but if you don't have any, it certainly will get you started. Um, but so far, it's, it's good. It's certainly a fun thing. I don't think I'd want to tour with it. Um, you know, it's not, <laughs> it's a $300 kit and there's, you know, the closest thing to it is would have, I went to Long McQuaid and looked at, you know, getting his uh, kit by Alesis and that would have been $700. This was like $400 Canadian delivered. Mm. So, you know, it's, you, you do kind of get paid. pretty good. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, I'll play with it a bit more, uh, this week and, um, and uh, I'll let you know next week. But, yeah, uh, yeah. Right. Report, so report far, back to us. Yeah, yeah. So far, some good fun. Cool. Um, and that's a Donner deal, and we'll have a, a link uh, to that. All right. And now on to our guest, legendary, legendary Canadian musician and author Greg Godovitz continues to be an open book with his new release of his new book, Up Close and Uncomfortable, available now. As a member of Flood, Gutovitz held eight top ten hits, including SoCan Hall of Fame inductees with over 100,000 airplays, a piece of Cousin Mary, Brother and Me, and Turn 21. As a member of Gatto, he released 11 al albums while touring extensively. One such concert was front and center for its 35th anniversary as a big screen movie, The Return of Pretty Bad Boys in 2014. And let's take a listen to uh, Gatto. Thanks for being on the show, Greg. Hello, <laughs> Lance. Welcome, Greg. I got Welcome. This, for, this is for Neil. Thank you so much. I, I, I got the impression that between <laughs> between you joining us before the show and now you're abducted by aliens and then returned to I us. I was listening, that... but I think you'll find this box pretty interesting. I got this from these people that spend a lot of time in India. It's probably going to crap out. It's called a Regini. Okay. Uh, oh, cool. It's a tampura. It's a digital tampura. Oh, my God. Oh, cool. And I use this on every record, even every record I produce, including country and Western albums. I sneak this in right as my trademark. <laughs> Trying to hold get it, it up in. to the camera? I will. It, it looks like this. Oh, yeah. It's by a company oh. called Regini. I don't know if you can see that. 
They make okay. a, a, a lot of droning instruments. So this would be the tambura. Right, and right. And you can do things like this. Now, instead of treble and bass, they have ladies and gents over here. Nice. <laughs> There's the lady sound. And then the gent sound. And you can do things like this with it. You've got, you got. So you can go through everything with it like this. And then we've got. I'm just going to see what I'm doing here. Here you go. I don't have my reading glasses, but it, this is an incredible little drone instrument. Hmm. That is so cool. Yeah, you definitely yeah. have to send us and, a link to where to where to pick one of those up. We'll share it on our yeah, site. I get, I got to see if I can find this other thing that changes. What's the? Should, o- does it have like a balanced output or? It, it doesn't have any way of plugging it. Every time we've used it in the studio, we have to uh, mic it. Mic it up. Yeah. Well, that's kind of uh, cool, actually. There is something here. Yeah, here we go. You hear the difference in the tones now. Right. And then. Right. Yeah. Incredible, huh? Oh, what fun. That's so cool. Yeah. Put that through a Marshall stack and then you're just <laughs> cooking. I, I've Leslie. used this live. Well, with the because I've used it a couple of times on my uh, my solo album I did with Paul Dean. Amuse me. And then when we had a band that could actually perform these songs, because they were they were not written for Gatto, they were written for like eight real musicians, you know. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> so I used it on stage, and we would have the keyboard player who had you know every single keyboard you can imagine. But did he have anything like this in all those keyboards? No, he did not. No. <laughs> so this was my secret weapon. And That's people, so cool. we would start out our shows with it, where you'd hear this beautiful drone, and and the lights would be, you know, coming on, and then we'd all come and find our places, and then pop into whatever the first song was. But it always caught everybody's attention. And uh, for the first year when I was in Calgary, I worked at uh, Axe Music. I asked if I could take over the acoustic room, and I put the store was just opening up. Uh, I over the weekend I put up four hundred guitars, uh, different, you know price ranges and Canadian and U S and all that other sort of thing. But I brought the Sharuti in and I left it on an E note and I could go in and grab an acoustic guitar and tune it in about 10 seconds for using that note as the best, just mm. little, 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 And the guys would come in and go, how the heck do you do that? You know, <laughs> well, aside from, you know, playing for 70 years, uh, you know, <laughs> yeah. the e, and it was a very calming influence in the room, you know, right. So anyway, huh. it's called a Ragini. I'll tell you guys, I'll, I'll send you the information on where to get these. Yeah, yeah, that'd be awesome. They, they make them with tabla drums. Okay. They make mm-hmm. them with uh, harmonia. Mm-hmm. So any sort of uh, drone instrument that's inherent in uh, in Indian music, you can find this company builds it. And it was a gift because uh, these people spend a lot of time uh, in India. Mm. Uh, in fact, I recorded an album. Uh, uh, the, the band was called Devi Narayani. And uh, the husband had started to produce it, and then they called me in uh, to sort of fix it up. And it was five women in Calgary. Uh, two of the gals were, uh, you know, Canadian gals, and the other three were from India. Mm. And they all wore bindis, and they all wore the robes, and they were playing. Uh, the, the girl had a, an instrument uh, called a, a, a verina, I think it was. It was a, mm. like a woman's sitar. Mm. And then one played spoons on the side of a thing, and they had uh, drums, tabla drums and stuff. And it was incredible for me to get invited in to produce it. What I did was I took all the tracks and ran them as one track. So it was like Sgt. Pepper, where all the music goes, flows into each other. Hmm. Nice. And it was just a fluke, but it worked out great. And its I have to tell you, Indian music is my favorite music. I mean, it, <laughs> as soon as you started talking about it, I, I got all goosebumpy and started screaming <laughs> for my assistant to go and find the, the ragini, you know? Yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. that's, that's, yeah, that's so really cool. cool. Because, that. That's really cool. Anyway, you know, it's uh, quite a quite a recovery from telling you that I don't know anything what you're talking about. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's interesting because when I hear you music, I hear your music, I don't necessarily think, oh, Indian music, but um, it's, it definitely seems to be a love of yours. 
Well, I mean, you know, being a first generation Beatles fan, it's a little hard to get away from it. And okay. and unlike a lot of people from the West that did not get what George Harrison was doing, I certainly did. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's you know, it's the most, well, it, well, it can be the most relaxing music because, uh, you, you know, in, in the ragged structure, of course, you know, half of the song is all this laid back, beautiful droney stuff. And then the tam the, the tablet player starts to go nuts. And mm -hmm. so does the sitar. And pretty soon, like it's, it, it, it's beyond Eddie Van Halen, you know, what, <laughs> what Ravi Shankar was doing. I once saw Ravi and uh, Anushka, his daughter at Roy Thompson Hall, and they did part of the show, and it was very showbiz. I have to admit, they were mm. doing a, a, a they were doing a, a, a duel, and mm. Ravi would play something, and then Anushka would do it, and then he, and she's going toe to toe, and then at one point Ravi looks at her, and, and then he does a lick that was like beyond comprehension, and she just laid her sitar down and bowed to him, you know, like, <laughs> which was a lot of showbiz, but it was also a phenomenal, uh, you know, experience to watch these two amazing classical virtuosos going neck to neck with each other, you know? Yeah. Anyway, so I, I love the music. I also love the food. So, you know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we're on there. We're all, we're all East Indian when you think about it, you know? Exactly. That's <laughs> we're <true>. Italians. <laughs> <laughs> so have your, has your songwriting process changed much since, because you've been writing songs for a long time. Do you think yeah, it's sort of changed your, uh, your approach? Well, <clears throat> I think my songs are getting better. Uh, when I wrote the songs for my solo album, when I was living in uh, in Calgary, I was working with Paul Dean. I don't know if that's probably glaring like hell. Oh, there we go. Yeah, yeah, there uh, we that's a studio it. I was working at. Uh, I'm actually all the guys in the picture playing everything, but I, I can't really play everything. Uh, and Amuse Me, uh, uh, Paul Dean and I uh, from Loverboy had a little Sunday jam session in a blues club. And we started to say, well, look at, you know what? He says, I got all these songs that Real Everboy never recorded. Hmm. These songs that you're writing are the best things you've ever done. He says, let's start, you know, working on them. And uh, there, there was uh, all of a sudden, uh, it went from the, you know, the typical stuff you write when you're, like when Gatto first got together, which was all sex, drugs, and rock and roll, like everybody does, everybody does it, uh, to all of a sudden these were, the lyrics got a little bit more mature. Uh, the, the playing got a lot more mature. I, I'm, you know, by trade, I'm a bass player. I've been playing bass since 1964. I, I used three different Calgary bass players on the solo album. And they all said to me, why aren't you playing bass on this? And I went, I've heard me. I'm tired of me. Yeah. I want to hear what you bring to it. And it was, a, it was great doing that. The only problem was when I had to start learning how to play the songs to do them live, it was no longer pumping eight notes like I do with Gatto all night, hmm. holding down a firm you know, foundation for the guitar player to go nuts on. All of a sudden, I'm doing moving bass lines and having to sing lead over top, which is, of course, makes both parts of your brain go like this, you know. But it, it reminded me of when I was 13 and the Beatles came out. And I think one of the first things I learned was the bass line, and I saw her stand in there. Mm. Mm. But do 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 And singing it. And going, well, they said, well, that's impossible to do. I said, well, he's doing it. I mean, you know, of course, he is Paul McCartney. McCartney but, so, yeah, what but do you do? <laughs> we never, because we were kids, we didn't know that it was really hard to do. So I'm going to be the bass player in the little band playing. I saw her stand in there. I got to sing it because I'm the bass player, because Paul's the bass player and he's singing it. So all of a sudden I'm 13 years old and playing ba doo 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 and singing. I saw her standing there, you know. We just didn't know. We didn't know that what we were doing was being difficult. It just seemed like a natural thing, you know. Hmm. So it sounds like when you say the songs are better now, are they more complex? Is that, is that what means, what makes it better or like more mature? Because obviously 1964, Greg, wouldn't say that those songs are better, or would he? <laughs> well, I, I mean, when you're, now if we're talking to the Beatles, I mean, they always wrote brilliant. So, I mean, you know, you, you look at the stuff they wrote when they were children, uh, and not even in the Beatles canon, but um, uh, what they wrote for Peter and Gordon, uh, the please lock me away and don't allow the day. The chord progression in that song is insane. There's about 20 different chord changes in that. And McCartney wrote it when he was 19 years old. Mm -hmm. 
And then, and world without world without love. That was that one. And then there was another one that they did, probably around the same time. And McCartney supplied both of those songs. Uh, Billy J. Kramer did one of them, and Peter and Gordon did the other one. But the chord structures are incredible. So that's sort of a whole different thing. My my earliest songs, of course, were all three chord wonders, uh, Moon Spoon and June lyrics. Uh, and then all of a sudden. I realized the song that you started out playing, Pretty Bad Boy, is an interesting example because there are oh, no. only three chords in that song. Mm -hmm. But the way I used to do it, because I had limited knowledge of chord progressions, the body of the song is in C, G, and D, and then it goes from D to G to C, and mm -hmm. then it goes D, G, C, G, and it's just those three chords, but they're done three completely different ways in different styles. Mm -hmm. And and then you go, oh, hang on a second. I'm going to teach a songwriting course. And I'm gonna, that's the first thing I'm going to show them is that you can take, you know, the Louis Louie chords and all of a sudden make them into something completely different. Mm -hmm. And that's so they started the song started getting better, you know, uh, having a background in Beatle lore like I did when I got to produce the albums under a pseudonym, which I did. Because uh, the record company, after I did the first album, they said, we don't want this guy behind the desk. He doesn't know what he's doing. So I came up with the name Thomas Morley Turner because it sounded, A, British, and B, important. And uh, it was uh, the guy that taught me my first chords was named Tom Turner. And he said, well, how? I said, I need a name like Roy Thomas Baker. He says, how about Thomas Morley Turner? I said, that's perfect. Is that easy? Yeah, I'm going to use that. And then the record company heard the second album. Uh, the review in Cashbox said, production sheen comparable to Boston's debut album. Wow. Meanwhile, it was wow. the same idiot that did the first album. But having that extra name really helped. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, <laughs> so marketing. It, it shot me in the foot, though, because people kept trying to find this guy to hire him, and nobody could find him because, well, it was me. You know? so, so, you know, Cashbox is raving about what I'm doing, and I wasn't ready to come forward because I wanted to produce the next Gatto album. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, on the third Gatto album, we were recording in um, – in Orlando, in Florida. And we, we gone to the Bahamas. I needed a couple of weeks to just sit. The other guys were out scoring dope on the beach. And I was, in other things, and I was in the hotel room with an acoustic guitar, uh, writing the rest of the songs for the al album. And it struck me when I was listening to the melodies of them, I said, you know, we could do a classical overture based on these. So they contacted a fellow named George in Orlando, who was the... Uh, he was an arranger. He was a, the guy that could re actually read music and he played piano and he, he could conduct. And we got together and he said, what have you got in mind? And I remember hitting a, an E note on the piano, but about, you know, halfway up the keyboard. You, you, I think you'll like this deal. This will show you how inept I am as a piano player. <laughs> uh, so I started hitting the E. Do, 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 do. I said, I want, I want a cellos to do that. And he goes, okay, he says, but the voicing is wrong. What's that? I say. He goes, Well, cellos would actually be down in this register. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden he takes them down and he's dun 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 dun. And I said, Now I want I want to hear a trumpet go da 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 da. So I pick out the notes. Da 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 ba 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 da 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 ba do do da do do do. And figured it out really slowly because this is the extent of my piano playing. Oh, mm -hmm. and this as well. <laughs> Both of those. And and uh he notated it and started writing this down. And then it went through a number of variables from different songs that were going to be on the album, recorded as a rock uh, group, but done as classical music. And they got in 15 pieces of the Florida Symphony Orchestra one night. I, of course, was resplendent in my pajamas. And uh, I also had my hands. This was, this was written left hand, right hand, <laughs> left wrist, right wrist, because while we were flying there... In the in the in the plane from Miami, there was this huge explosion, and the plane dropped about a mile. And of course, you know, the other two guys in my band became extremely religious immediately. Uh, <laughs> I, I got out. A, I got out a, um, a magic marker, and I started like you know naming my bits. And the guy beside me says, "What are you doing?" I said, "I don't want any of me in a bag with you." 
And he goes, that's not funny, right? I said, this is not funny. We're about to die here. So when I showed up at the studio, I, all of my arms and my legs and everything were all written with Greg's arm, you know, Greg's. <laughs> so the classical musicians come in and I've got my pajamas on and they're wondering why I got this thing written on my forehead. And Greg's stuff. forehead. Oh, and we, we have a full buffet laid out with like turkey dinner. Now, these guys have never seen anything like this. You know, there's candlelight. Uh, they got this lunatic running around in his pajamas and there's booze. And these guys all avail themselves, not so much of the food, but they're all hitting the bar. You know, now we have to start recording these guys. And most of them are in the bag. So there, there's uh, I'm the producer. I'm in in the control. I have a button where I can talk just to George while he's conducting. And then another button I can talk to everybody. And at one point, this guy kept complaining about this stuff. And I say, George, you tell that such and such. And the guy goes, I heard that. I believe it. And I went, oh, no. I pushed the wrong button. So instead of complaining to the conductor, the whole orchestra heard it, right? Mm -hmm. It was awful. But what happened was we ended up getting them to double track it. Uh, it's called Anacana Panacana. It happens to be on the third Gato album, which looks something like that. You double tracked an or uh -huh. orchestra? They didn't know we were doing it. <laughs> 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 wow. Yes, it was sort of it was sort of sneaky that how we did it, but we uh <laughs> we George and I confirmed. I said, "This is, sounds great, but it's not big enough." And he says, "Well, we, you know, we can't afford to do it twice." So I said, "Well, we got the click track, and we can we can mute everything in here, and then we can you know work on syncing it up later." And as it turned out, they were just loose enough from being drunk that they nailed it. And the looseness was in both tracks, so we just sort of you know found that wobbly bit in the middle and went, "Oh, hey, this works." So instead of a fifteen-piece uh, you know uh, section, we had thirty-piece orchestra. And then we used that piece cool. of music for 35 years on stage. And every time it came on, people would go, hey, they're coming on. And But that's the backstory on, on that. Wow. <laughs> so you know, been, the um, other thing on that album, we have a song called Chantel, which was done, it's French and English. Uh, it's like a Michel, you know. Mm -hmm. I saw her standing in the crowd, comme allez-vous? Je vais bien, merci, chérie, voulez-vous? You know, and then mm -hmm. I told her in my broken français, yes, I would. I guess it would be good. She smiled at me and said, "Si vous play, you know. So it's it's a ripoff of Michelle is what it is. Right. But we got, I wanted one of those, I don't know what they call them. Is it a Celeste? That's the accordion that they, they Oh, play? no, it's called... Um, a concertina? Concertina. It's called a concertina. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We couldn't find a guy, but they found an old Polish dude, much like myself, that mm -hmm. played accordion in a polka band. So now I'm lying on the floor still in my pajamas, which are starting to smell a bit funky and, and, and still like this. And this guy's looking at me and I'm giving him lines to play. And he goes, how do you know this kind of stuff? And I said, my dad made me listen to Lawrence Welk when I was a child. <laughs> so I, I'm quite aware of what's supposed to go into this. So even though before we, we got on the air and I told you that I know nothing about the technical aspects of music, you know, I hear you guys talking in, in your vernacular and I go, Hmm, uh, at the same time, there's some sort of like other thing in there that goes, I do understand. I just can't verbalize it the way you three guys do, you know? Yeah. yeah. But it's oh. just, I mean, it's, it's, it's terminology and anyone can learn terminology. It's, it's knowing what to do with the terminology, which makes the difference. Yeah. I, yeah. And, yeah, and, and, and you know, oftentimes, you know, for myself anyway, the, the, the better songs I write are when I let the theory go and just do it. We see, that's, that's remarkable to me that somebody can do that when you have that. Uh, I wish I had the technical expertise to be able to notate. So th the way I do it, unless this is my studio right here. Yeah. Uh, unless I, I go ba 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 in, into it, the song is pretty much gone the next day because most of the time when I'm writing them, when the aliens aren't around, I'm, you know, I'm drinking. And, you know, of course, you don't remember anything when you wake up, you know. So. <laughs> I wish I could worse. do it. Is it the same for Michael? Do you, I'm assuming that you're a guy that can write music as well, right? Do not assume that. Uh, I recently <laughs> learned about the Circle of Fifths, like maybe a year ago. So, uh, <laughs> so what? I'm, I'm, depend, I'm dependent on the aliens more than on theory myself. <laughs> Next time I meet you, I'll bring you these things, and you can you can hold <laughs> my alien exactly. here. Yeah. Thank you. The worst uh, part you is you can tune them in better with that. <laughs> 
Well, you know, these for the last number of years, I'll be doing something. I'll be in the shower, for instance. And, you know, everybody says, well, you know, we sing in the shower. Why well, don't? I'm just in there, you know, to get clean, you know, get wipe off that stuff on my hands. And, <laughs> and I'm in there in like October when all of a sudden fully formed in my head is my Christmas song that I ended up writing. Mm. And I'm going, and like, it, I can see the lyrics. I can hear them. I'm going, ah, you know, I, but I'm soaking wet. And then I go running down the stairs to the basement where my guitars are. And I'm like this. And, you know, my daughter's there playing with her friend. And the friend goes, Who, who's that? And he goes, well, that's my dad. Goes, well, what's he doing? And he goes, well, he's going downstairs to write a song, you know, like she knew, you know. Yeah. And then the little girl says, oh, you want to play Barbies? They go, yeah, okay. You know, meanwhile, there's this naked man running down the stairs <laughs> screaming, right? <laughs> but I wrote this song, a, a fully formed Christmas song called Christmas All Over the World. There, there's a wonderful uh, YouTube video we did it with a group called the Carpet Frogs, who now work for uh, uh, Burton Cummings and back him up and Randy Bachman. And we, we, we rehearsed it mid-October. We rehearsed it one day. We recorded it the next day. The next day we went out and chopped down a 15-foot tr Christmas tree, which we set up in my townhouse, fully decked. Uh, we all wore pajamas again, big on those. And then they filmed it in Super 8 and then put it in with all my dad's Super 8 footage from Christmas's past. Aww. And it, it cost us like 600 bucks. Yeah. And of course, every time I see it, it's like I see my dad in it. And he's opening yeah. up socks, you know. And, mm. But it's funny how they come. I mean, these days, I'll just be driving the car and all of a sudden it's like, bang. And I go, I got to stop the car, you know. And, you have to grab it when you can. Well, you know, <coughs> I don't carry a guitar, and I and then when I wrote some of these, I didn't have my little magic uh, recorder. So I'd be coming home from London, Ontario, and there's a road that goes down to Hamilton, or I could continue into rush hour in Toronto, and I went, I've got to go to Hamilton. So I go down the road, I go running into Pongetti's music, I said, I need a guitar. They give me the guitar, I go to the car and write the, the song called Dreams in New York City. And it just, you know... Now I've got it. Now I could go home. Mm -hmm. But it's funny, you know, when the muse hits, how different guys react. It strikes me that you guys have all got recording equipment, you know, in, this, in yeah. the house that you yeah. utilize. Yeah. Well, but but that that being said, yeah, you're. It, it's exactly the same. If you have an idea, and you're not in your studio, or you can't, don't want to take the time to fire up the software and me, my keyboard and my speakers yeah. and all the rest of it. Yeah, grab the phone, get down something, a melody, hum it, anything, whatever, and get down the idea, the germ of the idea. Or else you're right. You know, ten minutes down the road, you're going to hear something else on the radio, or the wife's going to start talking, and you're going to forget everything exactly. that you came up that's, with. That's exactly and, correct. And, and that's it. So you have to grab it when you can for sure and and we're lucky now we have these portable recording devices in our pockets i, I mean what i, do I don't do? know what i would do without this you know thing. back in back in the day that wasn't a thing i don't know we, 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 i read a book a while ago they were talking about stevie wonder who carried around a tape deck with him everywhere he went with a built-in microphone and that's how he captured his ideas when he was on the go right same thing yeah I, I'm doing this. Yeah. I'm, I'm writing a third book right now. I, I mean, th this this one. This was the first book, by the way. Travels with my app. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, and then th this new book is called Up Close, much like you guys. Up close and uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> up close and at a distance. <laughs> and and the uh, and, and my new book I'm working on is called uh, The Idiots Trilogy Part Four. And <laughs> and <laughs> what I've been doing is I've been two. as I remember more. I mean. Who the hell can write 800 pages of stories about themselves? You know, I mean, they just, they're all in there. It's just cut falling out. And people that read it, and, you know, I've had some of the greatest musicians on this planet have read, well, at least, uh, you know, the first the first book. Like Steve Lukather is a great friend of mine now because of this book. He says, Jesus, man, Eric Burden phoned me up one day and said, I read your book. I love your book, man. You know, so... Yeah. You know, it's just the stories are in there. Now Now it's the time to, you know, I'll go, oh, remember the story about how you let all the lobsters out in the restaurant? And, and <laughs> oh, yeah, I've got to write that one into the next book because that actually happened. So what is this book um, about? Is it uh, sort of road stories or? Well, the first book is, goes from 1964. Um Travels with my amp. I'll show you a, a picture that will corroborate the, the, the evidence here. But uh, so th this is when I started playing music back in 1960. I keep going the wrong way of this bloody thing. So there is me. Ow. 
at 1964 with the absolute perfect Beatle haircut. Mop top. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and I'm only 13 there, but that's when I started my career. So then it goes up through, you know, uh, the, the Gatto years, uh, the Flood years, the whole story of, of those bands, but also playing with, um, uh, you know, playing with people like th this picture was taken at Richard Branson's Manor studio when we were there, when uh, Mike Oldfield was recording tubular bells at the time when we were mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. I actually one night to stitch him up, I, I I said, geez, it's awful cold in here, Mike. And he just like, Whoa, he couldn't stand me. Right. And I said, I'll just get a fire going for us. And, you know, I'm stoking it up and he's writing his tubular bells. And I, I reach, I said, just need something to get it going. So I reach back and grab a piece of the score and light it on fire and stick it in the, and he, who, you know, he screams <laughs> and jumps over the table. And, he, and I said, oh, geez, was that your music? You know, and, he, you know. and then every time I walked into a room for the next two weeks, he ran, you know, sort <laughs> And he didn't like you. <laughs> no, no. He, <laughs> who could figure that out? Is this what music would, looks like? <laughs> he thought I was silly. <laughs> 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 I've got a great picture. To, I have a picture of Richard Branson. Uh, it's in, I think, the new book, Leaving CFRB Studios. And he's holding a copy of, of this book, which, which he happens to be in as well. Hmm. And Lord knows what he thought when he read that story, right? <laughs> because, he, of course, he made his fortune off that album, off uh, Tubular Oh, Bells. yeah, yeah. Ooh, that yeah. They, they gave him the money for uh, Virgin it, Airlines, I believe, actually. Well, for everything. I mean, you, you know, yeah. it, it was all whistles and bells because, you know, you're in this uh, – palace built by Oliver Cromwell and you know the house is like it, it's you know it's it's old you know you can see the old but you know just because the tapestries are like a little threadbare that doesn't mean that you can get the keys to the uh, the room where the eggs are kept and then using the tapestries for target practice that doesn't mean that that could happen but it did really <laughs> yeah, <but> it, yeah. <laughs> one night yes. we also found the key to the wide cellar that night so that you know Perhaps the two are connected. <laughs> Correlation or causation. <laughs> it, it, you know, it's all grist for the mill when you're writing a book. At least they've got these stories. And they, they still keep coming out and coming out and coming out. And, and uh, I was with, uh, and this is name dropping, but he's a great friend of mine. Eddie Kramer is a great friend of mine now. And, and you know, oh, yeah. we, so I was at his place last week and uh, I was telling him a story uh, that's uh, in, the, in the new book. Called oh, the Knights of the Pie Condom, uh, in in which we were in a restaurant and a friend of ours was going back to England. So a busy restaurant in the Eaton Centre uh, on an afternoon, and I go and buy a condom at Shoppers Drug Mart and say to the chef, "Our friend's going back to England. Would you mind building this condom into his shepherd's pie?" And they thought they thought it was a fabulous idea. Until and they all came out to watch, and the place is packed until Bob and I talked to him yesterday about this. He picks out his fork and he goes, "Bloody hell!" And you can see that it was a condom full of, and people started throwing up, and screaming and running, and the guy from the restaurant is going, "No, that guy pointing at me, he made me do," <laughs> and we just ran for our lives, right? Oh Lordy Lord, so. So there, anyway, there's a lot of those stories floating around up there. So yeah, they are they're, they're Turing stories, hmm. but you know, in 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 the second book, I talk about um, like the Elvis convention, hmm. or people are always seeing on Facebook us do pictures of food that we're making. So there's a couple of there's a couple of recipes of mine in this book, mm -hmm. but course. they also involve <laughs> getting drunk while you're making the food. You know, so <laughs> it's like. Helps. There's there, there's all the ingredients, but and then but when you start doing okay, you know, crack the egg, put it in the thing. See that bottle of wine over there? Go ahead, open it up, have a little taste for yourself. You don't like those people coming over anyway. So, <laughs> so. so a lesson learned from the galloping gourmet, right? Yes. Wasn't Graham Kerr always having his wine? Yeah. yeah. Mm. Yes. Oh, Greg, can we can we backtrack just a second? You you'd say you were talking about what you do when the muse hits. What do you do when it doesn't? I mean, you've got a lot of songs out there. They can't all are they all from the muse or are some crafted and worked out what's your process then I, i've had to sit down and write to order um a number of times i mean the the uh if you guys are hockey fans and you watch that's hockey uh i wrote that melody in the car on the way to the session it just once again came but then andy curran from coney hatch and i went in and you know you know nurtured it and you know massaged it and everything and it's been on the air for 20 years so we, we were hired to come up with the song 
you know, but I, I, it wasn't like went into the studio and picked up a guitar and it came out. It was sort of already there, like just this <laughs> anthemic, you know, bam, dan, 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 dan. I mean, it sounded like a hockey theme, you know. <laughs> and mm-hmm. as it turns out, for 20 years, they've been using the same piece of music, you know. But you, now, now that you have like the the phone, do you keep like a a, a a sort of a diary of all these different little snippets or ideas? We've had other guests on the show come on with like you know these massive lists of just little little hooks or little titles or little things that they can go to if they get stuck and say, hey, maybe maybe that idea that's rummaging around in my head now will fit well with this little riff or this little idea. And it can great great point. And make something. Great point. Well, I've probably got a hundred of the most embarrassing things in my life on this. <laughs> You know, I mean, because, you know, you're in the middle of the night, you know, and, and all of a sudden, hey, I got a great idea. And, then, <laughs> and you listen to it the next day, you go, oh, man, it's got to go. Was it? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but at the same time, uh, having this thing, I remember there's there's an alien castle in the in the Dominican Republic called uh, Castillo Mundo King, which I go to quite frequently. And down in the basement of this place, it's like the weirdest place you've ever seen in your life. It's this... German guy built this uh, this shrine to alien be- beings, and there's there's all UFOs everywhere, and paintings of aliens wow. taking your brain out and stuff. But in the basement, I remember I dropped something, and it hit the floor, and it was like the most incredible bell sound. It's it was like it was like the room I assume going to hell because it was just boom, and it went on forever. The decay was like a minute long, while the sound traveled wherever the hell it was going down there so we sat down there for about an hour recording it and, and it's on here so one of these days i'm going to use it as part of it <laughs> yeah you know yeah. so to answer wow. your question yeah like uh, except now like i'll remember you know letting the lobsters loose in, in the restaurant you know saying hey i want to buy all the lobsters and it's new year's i'm going to set them free and then I take them outside and, you know, and, and I'm going, run, my friends, it's New Year's, you're free. <laughs> <laughs> so I have to write that in the next book, you know. Yeah. <laughs> don't suppose you're anywhere near an ocean at that point, were you? Oh, there was, uh, there was, there was imbalance involved. There was a certain. Uh, a certain uh, right. Yeah, what what my, city did that take place in? What? What, what? what, what city? Where were you? Toronto, yeah. <laughs> okay, so they so the lobsters had a long way to go to get to the ocean is what I was wondering. I wasn't thinking of that, you know. All I know is I had a thousand dollars in my pocket and I bought the lobsters, and then the whole staff came out. Well, they threw me into a cab, and they were applauding, you know, and uh, and I fell asleep. And then the next day, my wife said to me, "I said, where's all that money I had last night?" She goes, "Listen, idiot, I'm going to tell you what you did last night. <laughs> you released the lobsters from the tank, took the little." restraints off their claws and then you told them to flee because they were free and then they put you in the cab they gave you a nice round of applause then they divvied up your money and threw the lobsters back into the tank <laughs> oh no i didn't even <laughs> get it was one. tough the lobsters didn't know anyone you know they didn't know anywhere to go that's right know. they were like <laughs> hither and thither they were just they, they were completely confused you know they had no idea of the no. doom that awaited them in that tank <laughs> that's true yeah and someday, Very short-sighted. Yeah, I know. And someday when the aliens arrive and they come out and they look like lobsters, they're gonna. I'll be their leader. They'll be, so it's, <laughs> they'll be looking for me. <laughs> so you, um, the ambassador, the Canadian ambassador, at least. Yes. So you've um, you've been um, producing um, other people for a while. Is there any sort of uh, bit of knowledge or a bit of wisdom that you wish people, when they approach you, would have? You know. In Toronto, the productions that I did were mostly guy bands and rock and roll oriented. When I got to Calgary for eight years, all of a sudden I'm doing this, the Debbie Nariani uh, album, and I'm doing a country album for a girl, and then I'm doing a heavy metal album uh, for a band that eventually got signed by Gene Simmons, all over the map, but they were all with female artists. And then I realized, I said, I got this... I don't know if it's my aftershave or or the, the, the candles that I like to light, you know, mm-hmm. or whatever it is. But I've got a real aptitude for working with girls in the studio. I mean, I really understand what they're doing, you know. And I found uh, Amy Bishop there. She was, uh, mm-hmm. she was on one of the episodes of The Launch. And she's the mm-hmm. best singer I've ever heard in my life. I mean, she's, she's just... She 
did a, a version with uh, Oscar Lopez, who's a famous flamenco guitar player out there. And they did Hallelujah. And you know, I'm a bit tired of the song, but she she mm-hmm. did a better version. I'm going to say it was better than Katie Lang's version. And it yeah. actually got her the audition on this television show. And uh, we did it on a Christmas album that we recorded called Bells. And it's, it's a great Christmas album because I, I said to her, I've always wanted to do a Christmas album, but I hate when you do... You know, oh, holy night. Yeah. And then the second song is Feliz Navidad. Da, 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 you know, and it just ruins the whole vibe. I said, let's do an album that people can put on Christmas Eve with a fireplace going and a glass of champagne. And there's no Feliz Navidad on it. Let's keep it really like jazzy cool. And that's mm. what we did. And it turned out really good. And then, and then we did a, 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 an album of her original pop music. And once again, I mean, I just called up the best musicians in, in the province and uh, and they rose to the occasion on it. Oh, that's great. So um, how long has the book, has the second book been out now? Just since December. All right. Yeah. And and uh, like, and it's funny because, you know, I mean, we can't play, you know, there's no gigs or anything happening. So mm-hmm. I decided instead of, you know, waiting to sit down and, and you know, really, like, I, I love writing in different locations. Like, uh, I, I, I had trouble writing at home because, you know, the phone rings or the, the mm. cat's, you know, scratching your favorite chair or something's happening. Uh, so, uh, fortunately, I know a lot of people that are live in exotic places that say, yes, I have, a, I have this beautiful chalet in the mountains in Canmore. And here's the keys for two months. You can go and start writing there. So I went from there down to the Dominican and stayed in this place. And then I went to Picton in Prince Edward County and finished the book there. And it was great. I mean, it costs a lot of money to fly around in those places, but I, mm-hmm. I can really get focused, you know. Mm-hmm. So I started. I, I decided to start writing the third book now uh, uh, to have it ready for this Christmas, you know. And a lot of it right now is about what we're going through during the pandemic. Mm. But Mrs. Claypool, my girlfriend, I don't know her real name. It's Mrs. Claypool. She she hears me cackling. She she hears me cackling away in the office and she she says, Why are you laughing out loud? Like I said, Well, read this. And she starts laughing. She goes, Only you could find humor in this nightmare that we're going through. And uh, everybody that reads both of my books, they say, you know, I I have to stifle myself at night because my wife's trying to sleep and I'm laughing out loud at all the stupid things you do, you know? (laughs) That's so (laughs) great. (laughs) I've developed developed in my my, uh, right hand, let me get this right. You see how my thumb is crooked? Mm -hmm. That does not straighten out. It's called uh, Dupuytren's Contracture. Uh, which makes it very difficult to play. Uh, but, uh, what, of course, what do I get? I said, you know, I've developed this thing. I says, you know, the trouble is I, I can't, let me get this, I can't even hitchhike anymore because they don't know which direction I want to go. <laughs> so, and she says, only you. She says, you know, you can't play the guitar anymore, but you can find humor in me, you know. So yeah, exactly. what can you do? you got to live with what you got, you know. <laughs> That's great. So um, no. where can people uh, get the uh, book? Uh, I don't know if you can see that right under my hand here. I, I got to get used to doing this. Go, yeah, right uh, there. Yeah. Shopgregodovitz.com. Com. You see okay. that? All right. Yeah. That's that's the place where they can uh, not only buy the, the CDs, but uh, we got posters. And I even had my own hot sauce for a while, but it sold out. So <laughs> <laughs> in Gato, we trust hot sauce. Uh, go figure. But it's really ah. good. So obviously Waiting for Gato. Yeah. So <laughs> people can, <laughs> they can find the two books there. Uh, cool. The first one. This one, no, this one, and the second yeah. one there. So they're both, they're both available. And uh, seeing as you know, we don't have any business. Please support my little business, please, please. Yeah. All right. Well, I can I can vouch for Travels with My Amp. It's a fantastic book. I read it. I can't remember how long ago, but uh, yeah, it's it's really good. Thanks, Michael. So so Thanks, I imagine yeah, the, the next one. I'm gonna have to read the next one. We I think we just got a copy of it t- today. Oh, so great, to, good. Did you get the PDF co- or the uh, the get Kindle the copy? Yeah, uh, PDF. PDF. I don't know if it's the same because they sent me a, the Kindle, the Amazon Kindle copy of it, mm-hmm. and I opened it up because I'd never seen one of these things, and all of the pictures were in full color, which they're mm-hmm. not in the books; they're in black and white. Oh, no. went, oh. For nine ninety nine, oh. you can buy the book with color photographs and they're crystal clear. I went, I, I'm going to start buying Kindle books, man. I'm kidding. That's yeah. awesome. I, I guess because they don't want to pay for the printing for the paper versions, right? That's yeah. true. I don't know what the deal is, but all I know is that when you buy the Kindle book for 10 you know, bucks, which is like a gift, 
Uh, mm-hmm. it, it, you, you can actually, if, if the printing is too small, you can make it bigger. Yep. If you don't like the color of the page, you can make it a different color. I mean, you can mm-hmm. actually play with it. Yes, awesome stuff. Oh, and well, are you going to do the uh, the audio versions of your books? <laughs> uh, we are we are talking about it. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I think because me too. screaming and yelling and stuff would probably be a good idea. You know, <laughs> it's another dimension to it, right? <laughs> an- well, another demented. <laughs> well, you, you know what they say, man. We are we are traveling through another dimension, and this is it. You know, <laughs> <laughs> well, back to your alien know. overlords. I do hear the band, and that means that's all the time we have today wow. on Song Going Talk Radio. Special Thank you so much Greg for having me. For I was, I was, coming. It was a great, great. Story. I was worried about this one, man, because you guys are all technocats, and i you know, I don't know anything except we're laughing. flexible. <laughs> great. Well, how can people get uh, more of your stuff? Uh, well, they can find it on Spotify and places like that. But uh, it'd be great if they started with the, uh, you know, the three albums. This was put up by an English company last year. Uh, they've got three different booklets in them and hundreds of photographs no one's ever seen before, and awesome. then the stories behind. So, you know, we sort of got another kick at the can, you know? Thanks. Awesome. That's wonderful. And, so remember, and you can we, get that at uh, Shop Greg Godovitz. Sorry, what? Yes. I, where? Shop, shopgreggodovitz.com. Got it. Lost control of Thank the Thank you show. guys so much for having me. <laughs> I'm going to go out with my song. <laughs> All right, listeners, we want to hear from you. So send us your comments on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram at Song Talk Radio. Send us an email at feedback at songtalk.ca. And, of course, check out the YouTube channel for live performance videos and full episodes. Now that we are all virtual-like, if you're on YouTube, and you should subscribe. Subscribe today to the Song Talk Radio podcast and your favorite podcast player. And don't forget to sign up for the free newsletter at the site. You can find the links to all the books and products and web services we mentioned here on the show on the resources page. And wherever you are in the world, please join us online via Zoom at our next Song Talk meetup. Free to join on meetup.com and free to attend the meetup. Stop by songtalk.ca for the link. And most of all, we'd like to thank you, the home listener. You can follow uh, Neil at neilmodi.com. How about Michael? Proudfoot420 on Instagram. And you can uh, follow me at philemory.ca. And stop by the website um, to buy past shows and see how I can be a guest. Stay safe. <laughs> Ready, good night. <laughs> something, something. Good night. Songtalk.ca, by the way. That was the, the site. <laughs>